everyone, and welcome to um, Booklinks event for Australia Reads. We welcome Jacqueline Harvey and Will Kostakis. So I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we meet today and recognise that this land has always been under their custodianship. I am on the land of the Jagara, Yagara and Yagarabal people and I invite you to write in the chat room the country you are on. I pay my respects to elders past and present. So first of all, we have Jacqueline Harvey, well-known author, selling heaps of books all over Australia and the world, I think. Jacqueline, let's turn it over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Jenny. Thanks for having me. It's lovely to, uh, to well, to, to know that you're out there, even if I can't see you at the moment. Um, as I said, if you, if you are able to turn on your, uh, your screens, it's always nice to be able to see the children that we're talking to. Um, so this week is a really special week because um, it's the week that we're celebrating Australia Reads and on Thursday, the reading hour. So that's a campaign to encourage um, children and adults all over Australia to spend an hour uh, reading a book of your choice, any it can be any book, um, and to um, to just I guess you know reconnect with the joys of reading. And hopefully a lot of you already love reading and that you you do it all the time anyway. But for Australia Reads, I actually wrote um, a special book just for Australia Reads. Uh, this is called Kenzie and Max Spy Games. And uh, Kenzie and Max are a couple of characters that I've been writing for the last well I think it's two years now. And Kenzie and Max are. 11 year old twins when we first meet them and they are training to be spies and so in this book they're off to uh, the, the spy organization that they belong to is called Welcome Tree Stafford wherever you're from. Um, they're uh, Kenzie and Max uh, training to be spies they're part of a group called Pharos and Pharos in my stories is the world's most ancient and important spy organization and uh, anyway, so in this particular book, uh, they're having, they're competing in their very first Pharos uh, trainee spy games. And so the kids get to uh, go to this enormous property called Alexandria, um, which is in the north of England. And they compete in things like commando courses and they have to build a, a Vespa, a scooter um, from scratch. And then they have to race it around a racetrack. Uh, they also have to compete in an archery competition. They do some pretty extreme parkour. And uh, all of these events, uh, they have to identify clues to be able to go to the next event. So it's an action-packed story, as I said, part of the, uh, of the series of Kenzie and Max. You can see it's quite a lot of a slimmer volume than a regular Kenzie and Max. So there's a regular Kenzie and Max and there's the uh, Kenzie and Max Spy Games. So it's only about 12,000 words, whereas uh, this one's about, ooh, I don't know, 57,000 words, I think. So it's a great entree and certainly a book that you could probably devour in the reading hour. So um, the other thing is uh, you, you might like to be, you know, you'd be quite pleased to know that it's $2.99. So uh, less than the cost of a cup of coffee. Not that you kids should be drinking coffee, but it is, uh, it is a great buy. So anyway, um, what do I do as a writer? What's my life like? So I used to be a teacher. For a long time I was a teacher and uh, I loved working with kids in schools. And in fact, I knew I wanted to be a teacher when I was about nine and a half years of age. Although had you have asked me when I was about nine and a quarter, do you think you'd like to be a teacher when you grow up? I would have said, no way. Teachers are terrible. I couldn't stand the idea of becoming a teacher because I had the scariest teacher in Australia for the first half of the fourth grade. And it was only because we, um, we moved house and I got to change schools that I ended up with the best teacher in Australia. And that's why I ended up wanting to become a teacher. Now, I can see there is a question up there um, from Kerry Carroll saying, that we can't seem to get the audio on screen working. We are on Durham country in southwest Sydney, a stage two, three class, uh, stage two, class three, four. How long does it take me to write books? Well, that is a very good question and one that I can certainly answer. The first Alice Miranda book that I ever wrote, which was called Alice Miranda at School, probably took me about two and a half years to write because I had no pressure, I had no contracts, I didn't know whether anybody would ever want to even look at it and publish it. So I just spent a really long time writing the book that. I wanted to write. I, I wrote the book that if I was nine or 10 or you know, years of age, that's the kind of story I would have wanted to write. So it took me a long time. However, once I got it uh, accepted for publication, 
Then my publisher decided that they would like to publish two Alice Miranda books every year. Now, Alice Miranda books are, you know, reasonable length. Um, they're about sort of 50 odd thousand words. And now um, I'm a very fast writer. Um, this book here, Alice Miranda in the, Outbook, in the Outback, which I wrote uh, over the summer, the, the, this last summer, uh, I set myself a goal. I, I probably thought about it a lot all through November and I started plotting out my ideas and planning. And then um, I actually set myself the task of writing 10,000 words a week for six weeks. And that's exactly what I did. So I'm very disciplined. I write quite quickly. Um, but it's not to say, you know, you don't just do that and then all of a sudden it goes to the publisher and it gets published. There's all of this back and forth that happens as well. So it's a bit like for you kids when you write uh, your first draft. I write my first draft, then it goes to the publisher. And then we do something called a structural edit, which is an opportunity for me to really, you know, change things and make things better and improve the characters and take big chunks out that don't work. And then from that point, it goes back to my editor again and we go into what we call a copy edit, which is more like copy edits looking for things like repetition with the words, making sure the sentences sound uh, like they should, making sure that the characters are consistent and all of that stuff happens for, you know, for another few weeks. And then we do something, um, we, we get the page proofs and that's when it's sent to you and it looks like the pages of a real book um, and it's all typeset, what we call typeset. Um, so basically, you know, you have a page that looks like a page that looks like that, but it's on an A4 page. And then that's your opportunity to go through and do the really fine editing at the end. So the editing process is really quite big and, um, and takes a fair bit of time. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I, I, write, uh, I write a, you know, Kenzie and Max book in about probably two months, seven, seven weeks or so. Um, and, uh, and then all the editing on top of it. And Clementine Rose, that was quicker to write because it's much shorter. So um, yeah, so that's uh, that's how I do the editing process and the writing process, and uh, and I'm one of those um, those writers. I'm probably I don't know if I'm I don't know if this is normal or not because I was doing an interview the other day with another writer friend, and she said, oh, that's not normal. Um, I love editing. I really love the part where I get to make it better and I get to improve it and I get to think, well, no, those characters don't work so well. Let's get rid of them and you know let's rethink that. So um, that's a really fun part about what I do. So does that, keep, keep the questions coming, guys, because it's really great to have some questions to answer while I'm chatting to you. So um, I will talk to you a bit about um, Alice Miranda in the Outback. This is a book that I released uh, in June this year. And I have to say, it's the, it's the 19th book in the Alice Miranda series. Um, but it was such a fun book to write because I set it in the centre of Australia. I set it, um, starts off in Alice Springs and the family travel south down the Stewart Highway and they go, they stop at these, uh, there's a roadhouse, Calgara Roadhouse. They end up going to a place called Cooper Pedy. And Cooper Pedy is a very famous opal mining town in South Australia. They then uh, have, have a few adventures in Cooper Pedy, meet a couple of really interesting people. Um, one character in particular that I love in this story uh, is um, uh, a fellow called Sprocket McGinty. And he's a crazy opal miner and he's not afraid of anything. He's not afraid of snakes. He's not afraid of spiders. He's especially not afraid of dynamite. And he's often blowing things up. And uh, when the kids first meet him, Alice Miranda is there with her best friend, Millie, and her dad, uh, Hugh, and uh, her uncle, Lawrence Ridley, who happens to be a Hollywood movie star, uh, her, her cousin, Lucas, and another friend, Jacinta. And when they first encounter Sprocket McGinty, who is an old, old friend of their father's from many years before, uh, they're, they're parked literally sort of at the top of the hill near his dugout. Now, a dugout is a house in, uh, in Cooper Pedy that is, is basically built into the side of the hill so that it's, on, it's, it's underground. And the reason people live under the ground in Cooper Pedy is it's very, very hot and it's much more consistent temperature if you live under the ground. So when they first, they're sitting there in their car, they've just arrived and all of a sudden there's a massive explosion, kaboom, and rocks rain down all over the place. And uh, they, they see Sprocket, he comes running around from the side of the house. Now imagine Sprocket, he's very, very skinny. He's very, very pale skinned. Um, he has very knobbly knees. He wears a, an orange bucket hat on his head and a, a blue singlet and tiny little shorts. And he's got a pair of thongs on. And he's running around picking up all these pieces of rock, trying to look for opals. 
And uh, the kids, or Alice Miranda gets out of the car and, and goes over to say hello to him with her father. And um, anyway, her father taps him on the shoulder and he's so shocked that they're there, he actually falls down poof, on his back and as if he's fainted and lifts his legs up in the air. Anyway, when he comes to, I don't think he really faints, I think he's faking it, but uh, uh, Alice Brown said, are you looking for opals? And he said, no, I was putting an extension on the dugout. So he was actually blowing up the, the ground to make a, a bigger part of his dugout. So he's a really fun character in the story too. Oh, somebody's asked me, where do you want to send Alice Miranda next? Um, she has been to lots of places. She's been to, you know, China and she's been to Japan. She's been to the Swiss Alps. She's been to Hollywood, New York, on a ship. Um, you know, she's literally travelled the world. She's, uh, she's a very well-travelled girl. Uh, I'm thinking about sending her because I don't think we'll be travelling any much further than this by next year. I think we might go to New Zealand next. <laughs> so, um, I think that's where she'll end up for her uh, her 20th adventure. Um, for those of you who don't know, Alice Miranda is, has also been made into a movie. So um, there is an animated um, feature film of Alice Miranda. It's called Alice Miranda Friends Forever. It was made by an Australian company called SLR Productions in conjunction with Channel 9 and Stan. And you can now view that on Stan on... Um, uh, you can view it on, uh, yeah, on Stan or you can download it on iTunes as well. We were meant to have another Alice Miranda movie launching this month. However, of course, COVID. So it's been pushed back for a, another 12 months, but it is in production. I've seen all of the, the movie bits and pieces. I haven't seen the whole thing put together, but I've heard the voices and it's been very exciting. And I've got to say, it's, it's kind of super exciting and really nerve wracking having your book turned into a movie because you don't know, are they going to do it the way that it's in your head? And one of the things, even though the story is not exactly the same, um, in the first movie, they kind of took bits of movie, uh, book one and book three and a little bit of book two. Um, what I loved about the movie is that they were really true to her character in the fact that they, they captured Alice Miranda's heart. And that's what was really important to me. So I love that. Um, I've got a question, has it been tricky writing this year? I think to begin with, it was very disconcerting because um, we, I came, uh, I came back from um, being in New Zealand at the end of February and was meant to go on tour for about six weeks around Australia for the 10-year Alice Miranda tour, and uh, sorry, yeah, 10-year anniversary tour, and uh, of course, as soon as I got home, pretty much everything was cancelled straight away. So it felt a bit, um, I felt a bit lost to begin with. Um, but then fortunately I had lots of contracts to fill. So I had lots of writing to do. And, uh, and I also took this year as an opportunity to develop some new things. And I've just, I've just signed seven new contracts for, for new books, which is very exciting. So I've signed a, um, the first four books in a new series, which will come out not until sort of 2022. Um, and I've also signed uh, a couple more Kenzie and Max books. Um, so taking that up to number nine and 10 and, uh, and actually two picture books as well. So I think that's eight. Um, so the picture books, I'm having a ball working on the picture books. Um, and as I said, they're still going to take a long time to come out. So one will come out at the beginning of 2022 and the next one will come out at the beginning of 2023. But I'm super excited because the illustrator of my picture books um, is actually a, a girl who is, she'll be completely new, a new illustrator, but uh, she was in my class in kindergarten and she was in my class in year three and in year four. And uh, when she was a very, very little girl in kindergarten, I used to say to Kate, one day, and this was long before I was a writer, one day I'm going to write books and you're going to draw the pictures. And she and I used to have this patch from many, many moons ago. And uh, I'm thrilled that she's just arrived back in Australia. She's doing her last day in hotel quarantine today, um, having been living in the Netherlands. And uh, we're going to, uh, to catch up next, next week. So I'm super excited about that. So um, I can't wait for everyone to meet Kate and see how clever she is. She's a stop motion pro um, artist. She's, uh, she's incredibly clever and really fresh and new and different. So I'm very, I feel very lucky to, um, to have her as the illustrator of a first, the first book is called That Cat and the second one is called Gloria. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a long time coming, but there you go, a little sneak preview of what's going to happen in the future. So um, yeah, so has anybody else got any more questions? Cause I'm sure, I don't wanna, don't wanna take any of Will's time. I don't wanna 
and I want to make sure that I've, um, I'm covering questions from people as well. Nobody's got any questions. You're all very quiet out there in, uh, in, in the Zoom land. Just leaving you a couple of seconds, but no, no questions out there. <laughs> so um, I will tell you, I am working on, um, I, I can show you what it looks like when I'm working on, oh, here we go. Here's notes back from my editor about a book that I'm uh, working on at the moment. This is the manuscript. This is double double sided manuscript for Kenzie and Max's Ebbets Adventure, which I will be working on as literally as soon as I uh, get off this Zoom call. Um, it's a story called, uh, oh, what is it called? Oh, it's called Kenzie and Max Takedown. And uh, this one, um, as opposed to, to this story here, which we have just set in the Swiss Alps in a very chilly environment. You can see, you might be able to see the Matterhorn Mountain in the background there. Um, so as opposed to the chilly environment of Switzerland, I decided that I would take uh, Kenzie and Max to a very steamy and hot place that I know extremely well because I've, uh, I've toured there a lot and I've, um, uh, I've, I've been there only last year I was on tour in Singapore. And so uh, it's been really interesting writing a story set in Singapore because Singapore doesn't have a lot of crime. And so I've been very careful about, you know, who the criminals are and how that's all going to unfold. Okay, I've got, oh, somebody asked could, you could read a bit. Do you mean of the uh, picture book, I think, but I'm, I'm not going to read any picture books at the moment. I'm just going to keep that under my hat for a little while. But uh, someone asked what is my favourite Alice Miranda book. Um, it's a bit like asking a parent who their favourite child is, really. And uh, often, and of course, parents, if they have more than one child, would say, oh, no, we love them all the same. But I will tell you that the book I found really incredibly fun to write was this one, the Alice Brander in the Outback. And I've actually, I've also created a fantastic interactive unit for this book, a uh, unit of work, which is all linked to the Australian curriculum and is available on my website. Um, and it covers all, like across the curriculum, maths and science and English. Um, it, this was fun to write, I think, because I did set it in Australia and I hadn't written an Alice Miranda set in Australia before. So that was really, really fun. Another question, what is the most stressful part of being an author? Mm, I don't know. I think probably deadlines can be stressful at times. Um, deadlines can be very stressful. And, and the fact that I'm often on tour and I'm still writing a book and so you're trying to write while you're in a hotel or you're on a plane or you know, you're travelling, um, that can be a bit, bit busy and a bit stressful. But generally, I feel very fortunate. I feel like I have the best job in the world and I've managed to combine you know, my love of education. You know, I, was teaching for, I was working in schools for 20 years before I became a full-time writer. And uh, I feel very blessed that I get to do a job that I love every day of my life. So um, that's, that's something to aspire to. You know, we work for a really long time. So being able to say that you love your work is, is really great. Um, so, yeah. And I think, I don't know, but I just about run out of time, Jenny. Yes, uh, we, we are getting pretty close to time, but if there aren't any more questions, we might move on to Will then. And thank you very much for giving us your time today. Right. You've been a great ambassador for Australia Reads, and I hope the kids have got some great new ideas to devour in the reading hour. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to hang in here and, uh, and listen to Will, and maybe yeah. you can think of questions while Will's chatting. We can have another three minutes at the end if anybody's got okay. a question. That sounds wonderful. Okay, Will, over to you. And it looks like we have mostly grade um, three, four children in the chat room still. I will. Can you vamp for two seconds? Someone's just arrived to drop off a parcel. Can I just tell them to it off? <laughs> Super joy. professional, I know. This is the joy. And, and I've just, my husband just made me a cup of tea because he's a sweetheart that he, um, he, he's actually working in the same office as me. Now, I know it's been an interesting time that lots of parents are working from home together. Um, yeah. Oh, somebody has asked me, do, do my children enjoy writing? Well, I have a stepdaughter um, and I don't think she especially loves writing. She's, um, <laughs> she, she's a grown-up. She writes a lot for her work. She works in uh, human resources. Um, she, she works in a tricky industry at the moment. She's actually the head of HR for Malaysian Airlines, which makes things uh, very mm -hmm. tricky. 
Um, but uh, I wouldn't say that Olivia loves writing, but I know that she um, she's a pretty keen reader. So, uh, and my husband is a super keen reader. He loves to read. Uh, I have four. I have two nieces and two nephews, and uh, yeah, I would have to say that probably only Phoebe, the youngest one, is is the most keen on writing. Um, it's it's interesting. They're all creative in different ways. I, I have a niece called Eden, who is actually uh, she was the model uh, for Clementine Rose. So she was. Um, I gave my illustrator a photograph of Eden that looked exactly like that. Um, she was about three years old at the time. And I gave her, uh, I gave Anne Yee, my illustrator, that, that picture or a, a photograph. And she drew Eden as Clementine Rose. Now, Eden, Eden's not particularly into writing, but she is an amazing dancer. So uh, she's, uh, she's very much into ballet and she's just been accepted into the Australian Ballet Youth Program. So she's, uh, she's a very good dancer. So yeah, I think um, the creativity can come out in families in lots of different ways. And, and I'm the only writer in my family, but I am not the only good storyteller. I, re I truly believe the reason I became a good writer was that right from the time I was very little, I was exposed to a lot of great storytellers. My grandparents, my great grandparents, I, I was very fortunate when I was born, I had six great grandparents in addition to four grandparents. Um, I still have two grandparents. My nan is 95 and my, my granddad is 93. And uh, they always told funny stories, you know, and we used to sit around. Uh, we always used to go to my grandparents' place um, for, for dinner on a Sunday night. And um, my dad, these were my dad's parents, my mum's parents are the ones that are still alive, but they lived very close together. So we often used to get all together. And uh, they were always telling hilariously outrageous, funny, often inappropriate, but, you know, great stories. And I, I want to say to you kids, one of the things that helps you to be a better story writer is learning to tell great stories. Because when you learn to tell a great story, you learn what makes people laugh, what makes them cry, what makes them glaze over with a look of boredom, like, please stop telling that story. It's the most boring thing I've ever heard in my life. You know, you learn how to read people. And that's a great way to practice your storytelling skills. And Will has a big parcel. What did you get? No idea. I just saw it on the floor. Probably shouldn't have. <laughs> Hopefully it's not going to break. Oh, so I'm going to hand over to Will and uh, I've, I've kept, kept them going for the before, last... Before you do, Jackie, I've got a quick question. So the stories that your family told, were they made up stories or were they stories about themselves? Because my mother used to tell me stories about her childhood and I used to be fascinated with oh, the stories most, of my life. Mostly, mostly, Jenny, it was true stories. Mostly they were very, and they were always fun though. They were always fascinating. And I've, I've used a lot of those true stories over the years, you know, and molded them into my own little, you know, my own stories as well. Um, my, a, a very, very quick one, Will, is um, my grandmother had a, um, had a brother-in-law she was not particularly fond of. And she, I remember she told us this story, how she decided that she was going to make this extraordinary afternoon tea for uh, when the, the brother-in-law and sister-in-law were coming to visit. And grandma made lamingtons and she made, she used to make the most beautiful lamingtons, but she made half of them out of foam rubber so that when and she positioned them on the plate so she knew exactly where the bad ones were and the good ones were. And my brother, my grandmother's brother-in-law, he was there like, these, these lamingtons are a bit chewy, um, Betty. And grandma was just trying not to fall about laughing. So, you know, I've got a few pranksters in my family. So we've had a lot of fun with that kind of stuff. But Will, over to you. <laughs> it's good. You gave me some time to catch my breath because <laughs> the lift went out. So I had to run down seven flights of stairs, oh. run back up with the box. But it's good. You know, it keeps me on my toes. Hi, everyone. I'm Will Kostakis. I'm a young adult author uh, in Sydney. And yeah, I'm an Australia Reads ambassador as well. And, you know, it's so much fun listening to Jacqueline speak. And please, if you have any questions for me, the same as with Jacqueline, just type it into the chat. If I'm talking and you're bored and you want to hear more from Jacqueline, please, I won't get offended. I'll wait until the end of the Zoom to cry quietly in the corner, but it's all good. I have a huge box to open later and the mystery of what's inside. But yeah, so uh, I've been writing for as long as I can remember. I remember sitting in the back of my year six classroom and I had to read a book and look, usually I would read books and I devoured them and absolutely loved them. But this time I started reading this book and I was like, oh, 
I don't like this. And it was a really uncomfortable feeling for me because, you know, I'd loved reading and everyone told me how amazing reading was. And I got three or four pages in and I thought, oh, I, this isn't connecting with me. I looked up in the room and everyone else was reading and loving that book. And I thought, oh, what's wrong with me? And I thought, okay, what can I do instead? And when I was in year six, my teacher always made us answer like chapter questions where you'd read a chapter and you'd answer the question. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to set up my book as if I'm answering those questions, but I'm actually going to write my own story. And so I started writing that story and I got to the bottom of an A4 page. I don't know what you're like. I know a lot of you are in, are in year three and year four, but when I was in year six and I got to the bottom of an A4 page, I thought I was the most impressive person ever. So I'm sitting there just like, oh, and my mate sitting next to me goes, oi, what are you doing? And before I could stop him, he snatches the piece of paper out my, from under my hand and he starts reading it. Now I'm really nervous because none of my friends have ever read my writing before. He gets three lines in and he starts laughing. And I'm like, oh, I'm funny. And then he gets to the bottom of the page. He's like, oh, Will, what happens next? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. He's like, well, tomorrow you're writing page two. So the next day we came in for reading. Everyone else in the class was, you know, reading. My mate's there twiddling his thumbs and I'm hurriedly writing page two. Right. The second I finish it, my mate snatches it out from under my hand and I start writing page three because I'm on a roll now. And while all this is happening, the kid sitting two seats to my left puts down the book and he's like, oh, I don't really like this book. And my mate sitting between us goes, oh, read this. And he passes along my story. And so now I'm feeling good because more people are reading my writing and my mate's feeling good because he sees a business opportunity. So he starts approaching kids on the playground. He's like, oh, you, yeah. Do you like this book? No, nah, I've got a story for you. Come see me in class. Tell no one. Bring 50 cents or a packet of Ovaltines. And so about six, you know, dollars and about seven packets of Ovaltines later, my teacher looked up from his desk and no one in the back two rows was reading this book. And it said they were passing around my story. And my teacher, he was one of those really strict blokey teachers. And he's like, right, what's going on here? And I thought, oh, okay, it's okay. No one's going to dob on me. And then instantly everyone dobs on me like the hands turn and point to the back of the room they're like Kostakis wrote a story and I'm like oh no my teacher collects that up he's like right Will my office tomorrow morning I get no sleep that night I imagine I'm gonna get expelled like the front page of the newspaper is you know boy gets expelled for writing short story in class mother disappointed and so I go into school I'm like this is it this is the end I sit at my desk and he's like, nope, Kostakis, office now. He invites me into his office, right? I'm sitting in there. It's not so much an office as there's a broom closet with two chairs. So we're sitting nice and close. And he's like, right, Will, I read your story last night. And, you know, you know, I'm in year six. I've been pushing the boundaries a little bit. I wrote a couple of rude words in there. And I'm like, oh, no, he's read them. That's it. I'm gone. And he's like, oh, Will. And he leans in. I'm like, oh, no, oh, no, this is it. He's like, so what happens next? <laughs> and instead of getting me in trouble, he got me to finish writing this story. And, you know, I thought I'd get into trouble for not reading that one book I didn't like. And he was like, Will, do you ever play video games that you don't like? And I'm like, yeah, all the time. And he's like, do you still like video games? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, have you ever gone and seen a movie that you didn't like? I'm like, yeah, all the time. And he's like, do you still like movies? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, reading is the same. Sometimes you're going to find a book that you don't like. But, you know, I really like this story and I want you to finish it. And so I finished it and it was about 26 pages when I was done. And my teacher was like, next year, when you go up to high school, turn it into a book for me. I turned it into a book and I sent it off to publishers. They got back to me six months later and they're like, no, nah, this is terrible. Never write again. And I went back and I reread it. And I'm like, oh, no, it is terrible. I can do a better job. And I kept rewriting it and rewriting it. I started showing my friends, my teachers, my family. They all gave me feedback and I kept sending it off to publishers. And then in year 12, that story that I started in the back of my year six classroom, I got a book deal and it became my first book. So what I really want to tell you today is that if you love writing, you know, you are never too young to start writing that story that will become, you know, your first novel someday. Like, you know, my novel, The Sidekicks, this is, you know, a book for teenagers. I started writing it as my major English project in year 12. My story, Stuff Happens Sean, which is about a kid that moves to a new school um, when he's in year five, 
that was based on my experiences when I changed schools in year five and also how I made friends with who would become my best friend. So not only can you start writing the stories, you know, that will become your first novel, you're actually living the life that might inspire, you know, your first book someday. And so for those of you that don't know what the Stuff Happens series is, it's a collection of about 10 or 12 small stories that each, you know, take you into the mind of one of the kids in year five at Monvale Primary. And you see the different lives that they have. So my character, you know, he's just moved from Perth to uh, the East Coast. I think the school's in Brisbane, but we were never sort of told. But in my mind, the school is in Brisbane. And he has to start at this new school and make new friends. And it's tough for him, but he eventually, you know, gets to achieve his dream, which is starting a school newspaper. And I see one of the questions has popped up. You know, if I wasn't a writer, what would you be? Well, the thing about signing your first book deal when you're in year 12 is you're too young to sign the legal contract. And so your mum has to also sign the legal contract. And my mum was like, I'm not signing this unless you go to university. And so I went to university and I studied journalism. And I worked as a journalist for a little bit, but it didn't make me as happy as being a creative writer did. So I came back to this. Uh, but if I wasn't a writer, I would either still be a journalist or I would be anywhere near books and writing and reading like a year six teacher or a librarian or an English teacher in high school. Like that's what makes my heart sing because this is what I'm really passionate about. But the thing is, the wonderful thing about writing stories is you get to try out all the lives you don't get to live. So I got to write about when I was in year five, I wanted to start a school newspaper, but I was too nervous and shy to do it. But my character, when I got to go back in time and write this story, I got to write about what it might have been like. And so all those things you're too afraid to do in your life, you can actually do that on the page. And it is that's one of my favorite things about being an author. I'm just, I'm watching the group chat. So if you put a question in there, I'll just quickly scan it. Um, yeah, uh, what story yeah. Uh, do I ever consider having another career path? Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so the thing is though, you can write about your life and all the things that happen to you for real, but you can also just make stuff up and have tons of fun with it. Like, I don't know about you, but when I was your age, especially year five and year six, I was obsessed with video games. And in particular, there was one video game that I played in primary school that like changed my world. And it was called Legend of Zelda, if any of you have ever played that. Basically this character called Link wears a green tunic, goes on a quest. And I love those sort of fantasy stories. And when I told my teacher, hey, I love this sort of fantasy video game, he then got me to start reading fantasy books. And that's when I started reading Tolkien and I read The Hobbit when I was in year six and I absolutely loved it. And then I thought, you know what? What if I got to write one of those big fantasy stories, but it was set in Australia? And so I thought about it and thought about it and ended up coming up with this book, which is for readers in about year five and above. And it's about three teenagers who skip school one day to find the ancient gods that are buried under different Sydney high schools. And they get to go on this sort of really fun, amazing quest, but it's set in Sydney. And I got to just sort of take that video game that I really, really loved. And I got to smash it into the real world in a really fun, exciting way. And one of the fun things about sort of being an Australia Reads ambassador is they're like, Will, do you want to be an ambassador? And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to. They're like, you have to write a book. And I'm like, oh, that sounds stressful. And they're like, yes. And you have like two months to do it. And I'm like, oh, and they're like, and you have to do it while you're locked down and you don't feel like writing. And I'm like, oh, that sounds terrible. But I ended up getting to sit down and I wrote this story, which, you know, it's a, it's a skinny legend, but we like it. And that's the thing. So often we are taught, you know, that stories only have to be super, super long to be special. But, you know, I loved uh, creative writing when I was younger and you can write a poem that is really special. You can write a short story that is five lines that is really impactful. And so I got to write a story about, you know, what it's like to have lived this year. And so this is about a girl in Melbourne who, while she's in lockdown, she accidentally goes viral on the internet and she stuffs up her life completely, you know, as you do. 
And so this is all about what happens when she comes out of lockdown and has to sort of rebuild her life and sort of fix the mistakes she made and sort of rekindle her greatest love. And so this is a book that's aimed at readers 13 plus. It's called The Greatest Hit. So if any of you have any older siblings or if you want to sort of save this for when you're a little bit older, it's available now with all the other amazing Australia Reads books. Um, and yeah, I've just seen a question. How has this year been creatively for me? Look, this is, it's been a really interesting year because I always thought, you know what? What if I was like one of the old school authors, like Jacqueline can attest to this too. Being a, an author in Australia nowadays, you don't just sit alone in a room and write. You travel around Australia, you get to meet teenagers, you get to meet kids, you get to listen to their questions. They sit there and they go, hey, I like you. Your next book has to have a boxing tree or else. And you know, you get all these ideas from teens and you bounce off them. And as fun as that is, it's really exhausting too. You're never really home. You're living out of a suitcase for a lot of the year. And I thought, you know what? What if I was like one of those old authors like Enid Blyton who got to just sit in the room and write in candlelight or whatever. And so when lockdown happened, I thought, oh, maybe I'm just going to be one of those authors who just sits against the wall and writes. That'll be fun. No, it was terrible. It felt like my brain was melting. And, you know, the thing about lockdown and this year has been is that things that we used to find really easy suddenly became really difficult. And we need to make sure that we are kind to each other. And we understand that the things that we used to be able to do, they're a little trickier nowadays because we can't sort of go have these really huge birthday parties and we can't, you know, go out and play sport and we can't do all the things that we really used to and we used to feel really comfortable doing. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was difficult to sort of start writing. And I made the mistake of writing and releasing two books this year when usually I take four years to write one book. Um, so that was really tough on my brain as well. But um, it's nice. I'm on the other end of it now and I've given myself sort of time to relax and now I'm really excited to get stuck into another story. Um, and I've got, uh, are those uh, Australia Reads books easy to find in bookshops? Yeah, they are. They should be, you know, in stock. But the thing, the wonderful thing about Australian bookshops is you get to walk in there and say, hey, I want this book. And if they don't have it, they can get it delivered for you. So every bookstore in Australia can get whatever book you want and they won't charge you postage either. So if you're happy to wait a few days, they can sort of get it in there for you and give you a ring, but it should be available at every bookstore until the end of this year. And they're, so they're kind of limited, so they, they'll be disappearing. Um, and look, please, if you have any questions, type it into the chat. Even if you just want to tell me what books you're reading and what you're enjoying, I would love to hear, is there a book that is not on my radar that should be? I've just finished reading this amazing book. Actually, I will go get it for you. It's middle grade, so it's for readers in year four and above. And it is, where is it? Where's it gone? It's gone for a walk. Ah, here we go. It was right in front of me. It's this book called The Boy, The Wolf and The Stars. And it's about this kid who has to find the three ancient keys that have locked in the wolf that stole all the stars from the sky. And he has to sort of, you know, find all the keys, set the wolf free, and then hopefully restore the stars to the sky. I've read it up until page 263. I've left this last bit because I don't know about you, but Australian Reading Hour is coming up. And so on Thursday, we've all committed to reading for one hour uninterrupted. No phones, no video games, <laughs> and no TV, no distractions. And I'm going to be reading the final few pages of this book because I am so excited to finish it. I have really, really enjoyed it. So what is everyone else reading for Australian Reading Hour? Um, and the thing is, if you don't have a book, you can go out and grab the new Kenzie and Max for three dollars so you can sort of get one of those books um and it's really great uh we've got i've recently read matilda wood's book called the girl the cat and the navigator really different but it's it's a really similar sort of title isn't it um that's uh, another question was what have i missed most this year i think getting to go into schools talking to kids like you 
and like creative writing together. Like I often write the best stories. Like when I set writing time and I've got kids writing around me and I'm writing myself, I just, there's something inspiring about being back in a classroom. So I can't wait to sort of get back into it. Uh, oh, The Little Wave by Pip Harry last week. It, it really is divine and it's so, and that's a really great book if, you know, if some of you like reading, but find it a bit difficult or, you know, sometimes it can just feel a little boring or you want to read something shorter or a little easier. The Little Wave is a really great book to sort of get stuck into because it's written, it's poetry. And so you get that sort of feeling where you can read the pages turn really easily. And it's still this really wonderful, lovely, gentle story. Um, oh, The Year the Maps Changed by Danielle Binks. Yep, another great middle grade book. Excellent. Does anyone have any questions for me? Or we can stare awkwardly at each other, which is my favorite pastime. I've become quite an expert at it, you know, on Zoom. Or I can do an unboxing of whatever on earth that huge box was that I had to run downstairs and get. I, I just I just wish, Will, that we could see some of the kids because <laughs> nobody's turned on their videos. Or I can just, I can snatch my cats and do a parade of cats. Which oh, is... I've, I've got a cat too in the next room. He's, um, but he's very sound. So, oh, there oh, is. Awesome. Cat. Oh, hey, everyone. Hi. Oh, that's so, really cool. Where are these guys from? Whereabouts are they, Miss Stafford? Here we go. Um, hi, we're from Padua yeah. College in Brisbane. So, oh, Brisbane. Awesome. Head. So, yeah. Are, are the students feeling brave enough to ask us a question? Um, they're Please. straight up. They're actually usually quite talkative, but right now they've been very quiet. But I'll just see if we can prize a question out of them. Have we got a question, Miss? Okay, do you want to come forward to ask your question, sir? Uh, come on, do it. Peer pressure, peer pressure, peer pressure. What's a good narrative? Oh, a good narrative to read. Someone is asking. I say Will Kostakis' books, but yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I would too. It, it depends what sort of, it depends what kind of, what kind of books do you like? Yeah. What, what, what do you like? Uh, come forward. Me. Come forward. Come, we're getting, he's going to come up, he's going to come forward. Here we go. Come on, so what, what year are you in? Grade eight. Year eight. Okay, cool. So if you're in year eight, what I would recommend for you is what book that I've read, that I've written. I think the first third is a nice sort of, it hits that sweet spot for year eight. And that's sort of, uh, this teenager is given his grandmother's bucket list to complete, but it's a list of inappropriate tasks like find your mother or husband, make your older brother move home from Brisbane and make your younger brother not a twerp. So it was basically me just making fun of my whole family and I got paid for it. It was great. <laughs> um, but that's if you like sort of realistic books. If you want fantasy, then I would go towards Monuments and its sequel, Rebel Gods. I think they're, they're really pitched at that sort of year six to year eight sort of age bracket. Um, some other books that I've read, I've got a stack of, let me just go to my library of YA. If you want, okay. Um, I'm still here. I'm just grabbing books. All right. So I discovered Terry Pratchett in year eight and he completely changed my life. This is Witches Abroad, which is one of my favorite Terry Pratchett books. Um, his Discworld series, but especially um, the books about the witches, really, really fun, really funny. And um, I just absolutely loved it. So this is kind of like Shrek, but just a lot funnier. Um, if you want something a little bit more mature and a bit creepy, uh, None Shall Sleep was just released by Ellie Marnie, which is like Silence of the Lambs, but um, with uh, teenagers. So really creepy, not the sort of book I usually like, got really under my skin, but really, really well done. Um, it's more of a mature read, but if you're looking for something that will sort of scare you, because I remember having friends in year eight that would only ever read the really scary books, that's one for you. But if you want something a little gentler, she's written uh, the Every series, which is like Sherlock Holmes set in Australia. And it's exceptional. Um, Steph Bowe's Night Swimming. I know I'm just bombarding you with books here. So I'll make sure I type them into the chat as well. Um, this is a really lovely, gentle book. 
by a Brisbane-based author, uh, Steph Bow, who was a remarkable writer and never spoke down to teenagers. She, you know, she had so much wisdom and so much empathy, but also just she saw humanity and she never shied away from revealing the world as it was. Uh, John Corey Whaley has become one of my favorite authors and I've, I read most of his books as audiobooks. Um, this is the only book of his that I actually own in paperback. Um, really, really great, but all of his books are pretty exceptional. Um, but yeah, were there any books? So of mine, right? I know you've, you've, you've helped us out. You've shown yourself on camera. You have asked a question. Like I, I owe you big time. Otherwise it would just be me talking or staring or crying into the camera. So I want to know of the books that I mentioned that I wrote, the first third or monuments, which one do you reckon sort of is more exciting for you? Monuments. Monuments, okay. So how about um, you get your teacher to either do, send me a private message in the chat or email me, email me your name so I can sign a book to you and then I can post it to the school. How does that sound? Wow, that's so nice. Thanks, yeah. Will. Sounds good. No, look, my pleasure. You were the first cab off the rank who asked a question and, you know, I really appreciate it. And plus, I get to, it gives me an excuse to leave the house and go to the post office. So, um, yeah. Uh, we've got another question too, Will. So. Okay, what, what, what do you want to ask? Do you write books about Fortnite? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a silly question, but anyway. No, 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 it's not a silly question. It's, I personally don't write books about Fortnite, most of because I'm really bad at it. And because my godson is in year eight and he pawns me every time that we play it. So I'm like, I hate this game and I hate you. Um, so I have some very negative feelings towards Fortnite. But if you are passionate about those sort of games, find what it is about them that you enjoy. Look, they're arena style sort of shooting games. Like that's, that's what the Hunger Games is really. So if you... It, it's not a silly question. It says you can draw inspiration from anywhere, but personally, me, I have lots of. I'm just very bad at Fortnite. So. <laughs> Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> Was there another question back there? Uh, yeah, the, the boys. Sorry. The, no. Hi. I Therese. Um, so the boys have actually got, they're writing some narratives right now. Yeah. So I think we've got another boy with a question. So come on down here, okay. young man. Excellent. Um, I feel like a game show host. Come on down. Hey. Uh, hello. Um, how do you like write a good story about like whatever you do, I guess? Okay. Like, right. So the trick with writing short stories in high school, because look, they usually give you really short time frame to write a story and there's lots of pressure. And they're like, write something super original. Original ideas, it doesn't matter in high school. What you've got to do is you've just got to demonstrate your understanding of everything you've learned in English. And, you know, it's how you write a story, not the story that you write. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you're not trying to write a novel. You're not trying to write an entire movie. If your, book, if your story got made into a movie, it would be a two-minute short film. Think about how much really happens in a movie in two minutes, right? At most, by the time you get to year 12, they're asking you to write like 800 words, if that, right? So what's 800 words in a book? It's that. And guess what? Nothing's happening. So what you've got to do is you need to make sure that you write a story about a pivotal moment in somebody's life. Usually two characters in a room, one of them has a secret. Like that is... Like that's the sort of stuff that you're writing in English. It's small contained stuff, not these really big sprawling stories. And that's a lesson I had to learn sort of a lot. The structure that I tend to use when I was writing stories in school that really, really helped me and I'll type it into the chat. But basically what it was, was I would take a character and at first I would establish who are they? Okay. And then there would be something in the middle of the story that would inspire them to change in some way. And I would ask myself, okay, what is it that could make their, their personality change? So you have a moment of change. And then if I have a story that starts with who somebody is and then in a moment where they change, what do you think should come at the very end of the story? I have to demonstrate what I have to show. What do you think? 
yes. <laughs> Correct. The answer is yes. No. So we have to show who they are now. So that's it. So you've got three things. You've got the before, and then you have the moment of change, and then you have after. And the best thing that sort of shows is, have you ever seen the movie Ratatouille? Yes. So, you know when, um, okay, what I might do is, um, could you actually give me permission to share my screen for a second? Um, I suppose, I, yeah. yeah. Is, is that from Jenny? Can you do uh, that? Yes, Jenny? that's from Jenny. Right now. Oh, that's an ad that's playing. So I'm just going to ignore that. All right. So... Share screen. Excellent. I can share my screen now. So I'm going to, everyone, I'm going to disappear and I'm going to show you here. So this is what a short story is, okay? Okay. So a couple of things. We're going to meet this character called Anton Ego and we're going to see a pivotal change in his life and it's going to take one minute. Okay, Anton Ego, he is somebody, he's a food critic. He loves to criticize people. Like that person who gave my book a two-star review this morning that made me cry. But anyway, <laughs> so what they're going to do is they're going to show how one small experience is going to transform his entire life. He exists just to criticize food and watch what's going to happen to him. Okay, so I'm just gonna take you through what happens now. I'm gonna put the volume down a bit. What are the two things that we are focusing on? We focus on what he's eating and his pen, okay? So straight away, we understand he only eats food to criticize it, okay? And look at him, he's shaped like a coffin. He wears deep blue, so something inside of him has rotten and, you know. So he goes, he inspects the food with precision, opens his mouth, chews on it, how do we know this is significant? His eyes widen. There's no voiceover that says, this was significant to me. All we get is his eyes widening and we know, okay, this is a huge deal for him. Flashback to him as a kid. Is he happy? No, he's a bit upset. Why? He's been in some kind of bike accident. He's sniffing, he's crying. His knee has a little scab on it and the wheel of his bike is broken. So he's been in an accident. His mum looks at him and she half smiles, right? Plates the food. And he half smiles back at her. So even though we know nothing about them, we see a conversation, but it's a silent conversation. Yeah. So they half smile at each other. She comforts him. So we learn what did food used to mean? Food used to mean his mother's love. It used to mean comfort. It used to mean it was reassuring him. And look at him. He's eating only with one hand. He's not writing anything. So he, food used to mean something else. So he eats and it brings him joy. He's stunned. The ratatouille is steaming. It has just changed him. How do we show that it's changed him? He drops his pen in a really melodramatic way. So we know what's that symbolic of? He's giving up being a critic. He blinks a few times, stare at the food. Now watch how he eats. He eats with his whole body. Do you see that? And do you see how that just happened in the space of one minute? Your story could literally be about somebody eating food and that could be engaging enough. Yeah. That was, that was a really good um, analogy. We are so, that's the, the English teacher and I are just going, yay, that is brilliant. You have done a brilliant job. Thanks, Will. No, my pleasure. And Jacqueline just said, start somewhere exciting. No backstory, there isn't time. And that's so true. But the thing is, if you want to become a really great writer, 
read. And that's why something like Australian Reading Hour is so important. If an hour seems like too much and you don't usually read, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, something is better than nothing and build that practice. I'm a writer. I buy lots of books. I read lots of books, but it is a habit I have to force myself to get into. It's not something that just magically happens. So make sure you take the time to read. And if you're having trouble creative writing, I learned everything I did from the teachers in my life. Just like I'm sure Jacqueline learned so much from the teachers in her life. And that's what inspired her to become a teacher too. So, you know, don't be afraid to ask teachers, look, is this any good? And what can I do to make this better? Jacqueline spoke about structural edits. When we're publishing, that's what our editors do. They're our teachers and they're like, oh, look, this bit could be a little bit better. And we bounce off them. Nothing we write is perfect the first time. So nothing you write has to be perfect the first time. So please ask for help from your teachers. They are your best asset going forward. So make sure you get me the name um, of the student and I will send a copy of the first third and maybe a couple of copies signed of the greatest hit uh, for a few of your students as well, or for the library. So just let me know who I should be signing that first third to um, in the chat or in an email. I'll just type my email up here so that you have it. But yeah, thank you so much for that question. That was, And I appreciate you showing yourselves on camera and sort of getting involved. That made this feel a whole lot better. And I really appreciate um, I really appreciate it. And I will make sure that I email to you, Will. That's beautiful. I've actually got one more boy who has got a question. Okay. Um, and I'll just turn it around so you can see him. And I know we're running out of time soon. But no, that's, yeah. that's all good. I love talking to my about myself, so it's all good. <laughs> hey. Hey. Um, my question is, do you know Miss Wylam? Oh. What is Miss Wylam? My, yeah. teacher. That English teacher. Oh, we thought that was a real question. Oh. So, so, Hayden, have a question. It's about, it's relating to the Pixar movie. Hey. Hey. What's the best Pixar movie? Best Pixar movie? Oh, okay. Um, I really like Incredibles 1. I think that's really tight. I saw Incredibles 2 over the weekend again. I'm like, oh, that didn't hold up on rewatch. Um, the first 10 minutes of Up are pretty perfect and heartbreaking. I love Wally, especially in the silent film portion. I thought that was really, really exceptional filmmaking. Um, what? What's your what favorite? Cars. Cars. Oh, yeah, cars. What, what about Look, Cars is fine. It's very derivative and just like, it's just, it's one of those hokey, like, oh, real America sort of slow storytelling. And it's like, eh, I'm, like, oh, I, I it's think, fine. I think like, up, up is the best. Look, I just love what a train wreck Cars 2 is. Like that movie is like the single worst movie ever made. And I love it for being that ambitiously terrible. Um, but look, there's something... There's something good. I think there's a lot to learn about filmmaking from Pixar. I really loved Inside Out. Like I thought that was really, really well done as well. Um, but I haven't seen it twice. And I'm excited for Soul that's coming out soon. So. And Will, the, uh, the woman who illustrates all of my books, she yeah. works for Pixar. She's an animator for Pixar. That's really cool. Yeah, so she works in Australia as an animator for Pixar. That's so awesome. Okay, well, I, I think we've just sort of like run over time a little bit here now yeah, cool. and, and think we need to um, bring it to a close. But I just really want to thank Will and Jacqueline for such an inspiring session. It was really, really good. It's just a pity there weren't a few more schools in there listening. But thank you to those who did participate. My pleasure. Um, and yep. uh, let's see again what you're going to be devouring in that reading hour on Thursday. Have fun with yes, yes. Yeah. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye everyone.